I never was predisposed, Myra, not to believe in the spiritual world. I, I never came with that mindset. There are some who have that. So the supernatural but, but, wasn't but, the issue. No, it really wasn't. It, it, I just lacked some definition. I lacked some, some terms. I remember a guy in my church came to me and said, you know, Pastor, I got this voice in my head. Really? <laughs> now, not only didn't I know at that time what that was, if I had known what it was, I wouldn't have known what to do about it. And now I would today. But not knowing that, I saw his marriage fall apart. I saw his family fall apart. I saw them all walk away from the church. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when God called me to Talbot School of Theology, which was an absolute surprise, by the way. I, ne I never had this concept, boy, I want to be a seminary prof someday. And that came out of the, the blue. That I was mean, right from the pulpit. Well, into uh, no, actually, the, the dean of the What's seminary it? called me and said, have I taken a position yet? And I said, no. And he said, well, can we talk? And he offered me a position I kept for 10 years. And so that was like, where'd that come from? And, uh, but I went there with that burden. I believe Christ was the answer. I believe truth has set people free. In reality, I didn't see it. I saw a lot of people come to Christ. I saw the transformation because of that. But they still seem to struggle with the same old issues. So when I went to Talbot to teach, I went there with that burden. And I got permission to teach a Master's of Theology elective. That's like a two-unit class, a fourth level of learning. So it was kind of supposedly sophisticated. It wasn't. I was a first grader teaching kindergarten yeah. students. <laughs> and, uh, but but that, that whole transition was really fascinating to me because in the next 10 years, you know, the whole foundation got laid for Freedom in Christ Ministries. And I started to see, literally, the, the, the lives of my students change. And, and there was two major shifts in that. One was in about 1983-84, I think I, for the first time, really understood what it meant to be a child of God. I mean, the Abba Father, where all of a sudden, wow, I'm in Christ. It was like scales just came off. Now, I may have known it theologically, but on a personal participation, he's my father, I'm his child, suddenly just boom, came together. Then I started to realize that every hurting person God was bringing me had one thing in common. Mm -hmm. None of them knew who they were in Christ. Now, if the Holy Spirit is bearing witness with our spirit, we're children of God, why weren't they sensing that? And that's the great work of the Holy Spirit, to do that, to bear witness with my spirit. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. How are we taught to pray? Our Father who art in heaven, that would make me his child. child. Now, don't minimize this. I, I was talking in England to a group of pastors, and a dear man, probably in his 60s, uh, came up afterwards, and he said, you know, I've been going around the country teaching a seminar on prayer based on the Lord's Prayer. This is the first time I've understood that when I said, our Father, that I'm his child. Hmm. I gave him a big hug. You know, that's still true. The good news is once they resolved the conflicts, the connection was there, the Abba Father was there, and suddenly scripture made sense to them and they could read it before they would just struggle and it all seemed to be condemnation and now it wasn't anymore. Hmm. So uh, I, I struggled. Why in the world we don't know this? Well, truth can't set you free if you don't know it. And so part of the problem is the old prophet in the Old Testament said people are perishing for lack of knowledge. So that's part of the problem. I mean, you've you got to know the truth or the truth can't set you free. But secondly, what I've discovered is, is a genuine lack of repentance. And mm -hmm. that's global. Uh, not even sure how to do that. You, but you emphasize confession and repentance as yeah. power tools to be set free. Well, Jesus said in Mark 1, repent and believe. Paul mm -hmm. preached repentance everywhere. Where's the repentance? We see a lot of people caught in sin and they're sorry, they got caught. And we see people caught in the sin, confess, sin, confess cycle. But confession is the first step to repentance, but it is not genuine repentance. And well, so Repentance is literally turning around and going another way. But some would say, I, I am plagued by this besetting sin yeah. or this thought life yes. or this, yes. this personal torment. They don't have the power to live differently. They do. They just don't know it. Ah. See, here's the interesting thing. Paul prays for two things in Ephesians. I mean, obviously, to take a six chapters uh, of a, an epistle like that, and then you set aside a, a, a specific prayer, chapter 1 and chapter 3. Obviously, there's kind of, boing, something here very, very important. So what does he pray for? First of all, if you recall Ephesians chapter 1, he's talking about this incredible position we have in Christ. Our I inheritance. I mean, seated with Christ in the heavenlies, our inheritance, whatever else. So that's all true. What's the problem then? We don't see it. So he prays that our eyes would be open, that we would know the rich inheritance that we have in Christ and the power that has been 
extended towards us who believe. There's not a verse in the Bible where you need to pursue power. You already have it. You already have this identity, this position in Christ. And, but we just don't see it. And so what else does he pray for? Chapter 3. That we would know the love of God that goes beyond knowledge. You say, well, that's trivial. Everybody knows God loves them. They're mm -mm. not oh. walking in that love. Oh, no. I tell you what. We used to have a program on Sunday nights called Touched by an Angel. Mm -hmm. And every week, same message. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. And you say, oh, come on. I've heard this a thousand times. Everybody knows that God loves us. No, they don't. No, I tell you what. The majority of people sitting in our church are questioning God's love of them. Mm -hmm. Majority. Vast majority. Any church you name. It's, it's true in every one of them. Every person I've counseled is questioning God's love for them. And uh, so those are obviously just very, very critical issues. And uh, uh, to take that one step farther, look at the high priestly prayer. I mean, you, in John 17, you get a glimpse of, of, of what's in the mind of God. He's about to go to the Father and leave behind the 11. He's already lost one. Mm -hmm. Judas, who was, the, who was that filled the heart of Judas to betray Christ? It was the devil, right? So you get a glimpse. You wonder what... God, what do you think of our world today? You know, you've been gone now a couple thousand years, and we're a mess, folks. Countries are falling apart. People are failing. Church is declining, you know, in America, and it is, unfortunately. I said, uh, what, you know, what are you waiting for? Come back. I, guys, that's the question I ask myself every now and then. But, <clears throat> but the point of it is, what's his concern? What's on his mind? Very clearly, he says, I ask not that you take them out of the world, but you keep them from the evil one. Mm -hmm. Sanctify them in thy word. Thy word is... Truth. Truth. And uh, there's so, the power to. You know, and when you got much of the church in the Western Hemisphere not even assured of the fact that there is an evil one. Well, and, and biblically yet this is illiterate. the first concern of our Lord. Yeah, you know, well, biblically illiterate is certainly a part is of it. Is that not true? Yes, really? It is. And I it's mean, becoming more so. Yeah. You know, most of us in Canada and the United States grew up, you know, going to churches. A lot of us did, anyhow. We got Bible, some Bible knowledge. Our young kids, they don't have a clue. They think Moses is the basketball player. <laughs> so we're not firmly rooted in Christ. That is one huge issue. Yes. Uh, in, in the seven steps to freedom in Christ, you say it's just an old-fashioned house cleaning that takes into account the realities of the spiritual world. I had a Christian school principal apologize to me that our denomination doesn't believe in a personal devil. Evil, yes, but not Satan. That, that, what a tragic statement that is. The church, you know, position has always been that we believe in a personal devil. That doesn't mean you have your own personal one. It means he's a person. You can't have evil without personhood. And, uh, unfortunately, what happens is we, we operate as though there's only one kingdom. That is not true. When you look at scripture in total, what is the whole battle? It's between good and evil. It's between the Christ and the Antichrist. Kingdom the false of darkness. Prophet, True kingdom prophets, of kingdom of darkness, kingdom of God's yeah. beloved son. Yeah. You, you can't go into this thing with that mindset there's only one kingdom. There is a kingdom of darkness, and God has transferred out, us out of that kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's beloved son. Uh, who's the God of this world? Satan is. Jesus referred to him as the ruler of this world. You can't leave that part of reality out and have an adequate answer. And, we, and we're, we're totally dependent upon God to reveal the nature of that to us because it is beyond our five senses. It's very hard for a Westerner to understand what Paul says, that which you see is temporal and passing away, that which you don't see is eternal. So for Paul, the reality of the spiritual world is just as real as the natural one, that is passing away. Actually, the one you don't see is eternal. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, come on folks, I mean, trust God and believe in this because if you don't, you have no reason to put on the armor of God. You have no reason to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. You can only submit to God. You don't have to resist the devil. That, that's all bogus thinking. You don't have a complete answer. Now, listen to who's saying that to you right now. Left-brained aerospace Neil Anderson. Uh -huh. I mean, I had to go through a lot of paradigm shifts to get where I'm at today. Mm -hmm. and, and it was and none of them were easy. Every one of them was a struggle for me to say, well, what is actually going on here? I, and I've never had any curiosity about the occult. There's nothing fascinating about that to me. I'm a little unusual in that, by the way. The lure of knowledge and power has attracted travelers around the world for 2,000 years. I don't know my astrological sign to this day. I don't care. That's not my interest. That's not my focus either. But I do believe that there is a God of this world and that there's a hierarchy of demons. And, and Martin Luther was right when he said, although this world, the devil's filled. It's true. 
Mm -hmm. we, we see the evidence of that all over the world. So if you want a whole answer, you got to submit to God, but you also have to resist the devil. You can't just say, I'll submit to God and have a complete answer. You, it won't be adequate. It's not wrong. It's just inadequate. It's just incomplete. Well, there's so much. We are just scraping the surface. This is a little warm up with uh, Dr. Anderson. I want to say, too, you're not just sharing a, a philosophy or theology that you've embraced. The proof is in changed lives for decades all over the world. That's the best advertisement we got is a changed life. I said, how do you, you know, where, where once I was blind, now I see. Mm -hmm. Remember, everybody said, you know, give credit to somebody else. I said, hey, where once I was blind, now I see. <laughs> and, and you got enough fruit out there. Uh, after a while, people say, what is that? What, and think, Myra, what that does to our witness. If you're struggling in depression and you're having panic attacks and, and you can't stop, you know, fornicating or whatever your problem is, what's your witness? Hey, why should be a Christian and be like me? No, thanks, you know. And so you got a bunch of depression. Who's filling our mental hospitals, by the way? Many of them are, are Christians. And uh, somewhere we're going to have to talk about that. We what is are. the difference between the battle for my mind as well as, you know, what is truly a mental illness. And because that really plays into what we're talking about. Oh, and we will, and we will. In his latest book, Dr. Anderson writes, people all over the world are dying in a lifeless maze for want of someone to gently show them the way, the truth, and the life. Neil Anderson has been that gentle shepherd. He continues to help and equip the body of Christ. If you haven't read The Bondage Breaker, you don't want to miss this classic. It has been a tool in the hand of God to transform thousands of lives. Uh, if you have read it, uh, you want to take the next step. Uh, these are such important and timely books. We decided to offer you the choice in return for your financial gift to this ministry. Thank you so much.